So we're going back in time to 1916 on a trench somewhere here on the line at the Somme. Uh, we will be flipping the camera around, <laughs> meaning that some of the equipment will be looking backwards because of the flipped camera. But we'll take you into this trench now where you can meet some of our Tommies and hopefully we'll be answering some great questions about life in the trenches. So. Welcome to Gentleman's Walk. Here with the 8th Service Battalion, Royal Norfolk, uh, Norfolk Regiment. We're going to talk to you today um, about the life in the trenches. Um, we're sort of in the middle of the Battle of the Somme, so you'll find out a bit more about that. Time portal in position. So, I've got our first question. I think they want to know is what the food was like for us. What, do you, what was food like? Talk it loud. <laughs> the food, not bad. In yeah. fact, we'll show you. We've got some something going on at the moment. We've got a bit of cooking going on. It was a lot of tin food. We'll show you. you see. You can see we've got the beef stew and corned beef there. So we're trying to make a bit of a soup. We've got a bit of downtime, so the Germans aren't shelling us at the moment. So we're just trying to make a sort of two-man stew there. Some hardtack biscuits, which are sort of all weather, all all weather, and they last for a very long time. And they're as hard as nails, aren't they? They yeah, are incredibly hard. I think I might have broken a tooth once. Yeah, you have to biscuits. smash it up with your bayonet and then cook it in your mess tin to make it go nice and soft. But I mean, we were eating these biscuits, so these were brought over in 1914. So these have been sitting here for two two years and they're doing all right. They're not too bad. But we've got some famous beef stew, a bit of trench stew, and anything we can add for a bit of flavour. Got some vinegar, a bit of sauce. But we've got our corned beef. So, and anything we could steal off local French farms, sorry, borrow off local steal. French farms. The French have, had, have been very kind to us so far, so they've, they've given us lots of nice food. Lovely fresh chicken's eggs, <laughs> they're laid probably this morning or yesterday morning. So and if we were going through, passing through a well. field of carrots, we would uh, certainly try and stock up. We've got a bit of chocolate there that's come from home. Uh, it's being rationed back home, but uh, they've managed to send us some over. So the food's not too bad. You can't complain. It's sort of anyone can make a stew. <laughs> and a lot of the time it's just simple meals that some of us were perhaps eating at home. Anything to add about food? Yeah. So uh, obviously we have all the tin food. Um, anything we could get our hands on. Like uh, Ethan said there, um, but you know, we can't complain. Uh, we're obviously out here in the trench, so we have to make do and mend, get what we could have. Yep, lots of the food brought up, particularly uh, our favourites is uh, is jam. There's Ooh, an awful jam. lot of jam. Yeah, bloody jam. Uh, <laughs> the favourite they like to send us is plum and apple. So there seems to be. An awful lot of ticklers, plum and apple and jam around. Yeah, the chocolate when we got chocolate and, yeah. sent in parcels from home, of course. So how long, how long did the men spend in a frontline trench? Well, that's a very, very good question. And it's not as long as a lot of people seem to think. Uh, particularly my private Reuben here. He's just come back from leave. So he's been home enjoying fried, fried breakfasts and things. <coughs> but particularly, you'd spend about two or three, four days perhaps at the most in a frontline trench doing some fighting. I mean, luckily our generals, they know that keeping men out here for too long is going to send them a bit crazy. Are you crazy yet? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so you spend, we're, uh, we've been here oh, for sort of three days now, so we're coming to the end of our, our stint in the front line. 
and then we're going back to a reserve line for a few days in case there's an attack and we need it up here again. Uh, but after that, we're off to a French town, aren't we? Rest centre. The rest centre, yeah, lucky yeah. us. Uh, I hear they've got lovely women there, so I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that, but uh, yeah, we're going to get a nice bath for once. We're make a change. He's never had a bath in his life, that one, so I'll make a nice change. <laughs> uh, we might get a clean uniform if we're lucky. Um, <coughs> And some, some decent food. They've got some nice restaurants in, in our rest village. We get ourselves some nice egg and chips, perhaps. Something a bit like that. Mm. So it's not all that bad, really. We're not here too long. Uh, but it's why you are here that it gets a bit hectic. Particularly on busy days, uh, we like to say. If there's a German attack coming or if you're going over the top. But on average, you know, we're not, we're not out here all the time. So, what else? How did we wash? Oh, that's a very, very good question. Reuben, how do you wash? Well, I try and wash as best I can with the water I can find and the flannel I have. But we don't wash very often, do we? Well, not in a frontline trench, no. There's not an awful lot of time. But every morning you must have a shave. You must at least try to get yourself clean. Hygiene is very, very important. Uh, so we do our best on that front. Brushing your teeth and that sort of thing. We've got, got nothing really, but uh, yeah, to, to keep clean is very, very important. Staying, staying hygiene, of course, in the trench. What rank are we? Well, that's a very good question. We're just privates, so we fetch and carry things, perhaps. <coughs> so in a sort of section like this of trench, you'd have perhaps your captain in his dugout down there, two sergeants, a handful of corporals, and the rest would be privates. So that's what we are, we're not, we haven't got any rank. We might be tradesmen, we might have a trade, so Private Reuben, Private Harvey there, could be a machine gunner, so he'd wear a machine gunner's badge. So not necessarily rank, but trade. What are the conditions like? Well, the conditions vary, uh, depending on the weather you had and the different um, scenery you might have been in. Uh, but in the moment, we're in the, the heat of the summer, um, so the, very, the trenches are very dry, uh, it's very hot, uh, with probably a few lice, well not few, but lots of lice mm, yeah, all over us, they're very itchy. Uh, rats as well, horrible rats in the trench, but then when the colder weathers and the wetter weathers, the trench would be pretty much liquid mud, um, you're very uncomfortable to walk in, you might have heard the trench foot, that was very common, you might lose a couple of toes uh, from the wet and the cold, muddy trenches. But some trenches did um, have wooden slates on the bottom to keep the water out, and even then the water would have come a lot higher. Uh, that's why we wear our uh, putties here. Yeah, if you can see them. You can see. These are the famous putties. They're bloody, bloody nuisance to put on, to, to wrap around the legs. But they're good. They support us when we're marching long distances, which you seem to do an awful lot of. Yeah. Uh, but they do take a bit of getting used to putting on. Oh, what have we got? Have you had any injuries? Well, that's a, that's a good question. You've been injured once or twice. Well, I've only been out here for about a year now. Um, in the army a year now, but so I haven't had many big injuries. But unfortunately, unfortunately, I did have a small shrapnel wound to my left knee um, in one of the tent days there. Ethan. Oh, I'm very sorry. I'm just... Have you got any injuries? Me? Oh, hundreds of injuries. Me? Nah. Nothing too serious. What we, we sometimes get, some of the lads, they get a blighty one, which means uh, you'd get wounded just enough to get sent home, but you wouldn't be killed. But personally, I haven't been too badly wounded. We've come up against gas a few times uh, already, even though we haven't been here uh, for too long. But we've come up with a bit of gas, that gas is horrible. It itches your back of your throat. <laughs> Gets in your lungs. Your eyes. Yeah, sore eyes. So, nothing too major, luckily. What other Allied armies have we come across? Oh, well, some stories there. We came across some very nice French troops. Uh, it was sort of the first week that I came out here, yeah, right back at the beginning of the war. I came across a nice unit of Frenchmen, and they're very friendly, sharing with us uh, their cigarettes and their what they call those quass, quass things. Yeah. The, the, pastry, the roly yeah. bread, the roly bread. It's good stuff, it's good stuff. <laughs> what about you? Any allies? 
Uh, like I say, I've not been out here long, so I've only been stuck here with me the British pals. Yeah, not been too bad though. Not been too bad. I remember back in the day when the French were fighting around in their lovely red trousers, and you know, I told you stories, didn't I? Seeing the French in the distance with shiny helmets, particularly the horses, the cavalry, shiny helmets, smart red trousers. Well, I mean, it didn't last too long. I soon learned that you couldn't necessarily fight a modern war in uh, red trousers. How do you feel about the war? Oh, that's a good question, that one. Ruben, how do you feel about the war? Well, I'm nervous, but obviously I'm sure we're going to win this war whenever it's over. Uh, Ethan here, he, he was obviously in the war, uh, well, he was in the army before the war started, so he was told the war was going to finish by Christmas. Yeah. But unfortunately it didn't, and we're still here. Um, but I'm confident we're going to win. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not too bad, you know. Uh, I was in the army before the war, had a bit of service out in Northern Ireland with uh, the 1st Battalion of the Norfolk Regiment before we all came over here and got jumbled all over the place. But, uh, you know, we're soldiers. We're professional soldiers. We're here to do a job in the same way that uh, uh, a window cleaner or a blacksmith might do his job. He's got his tools, he's got his ladder, and he's just got a rifle and a bayonet. You know, you just don't think about it too much. You're here, get the job done. Uh, you don't bother too much with politics, the generals and the politicians that seem to, to want to carry on with the war, let them get on with it. Just get the job done, get paid, make the best of a bad situation. How many gas masks do we carry? Well, I think you've got one on, but I've only got I've the only two got on. One. Take that one out. But have we only got the two on me at the moment and we carry these PH hoods. I remember when gas first came about. We didn't really have anything, we had a few socks. What do you do when we first got gassed? Well, Go on, tell I, I only arrived in France in July 1915, but um, well, that's, well, that's, gas was first used just a couple of months before I arrived. Um, and there's these stories, um, well, it wasn't these stories, it was me who was involved. <laughs> and I've got these stories of using my old sock and I would just dip it in a, a bucket of urine. Or, you know what, all of us men that are toilets and have to use that to cover my face, cover my nose, and hopefully the gas would protect me. Oh, sorry, hopefully the urine would protect me from that. But yeah. then they came out with these flannel masks that um, got, yeah, we carry two of these at the moment. These are the, the pH hoods, so these would be dipped in neutralizing chemicals, and then you'd wear it over your head. And you couldn't see very much, these might steam up. I tend to steam up quite quickly, but it's better than nothing. It does. It we does always work. have to carry them. Yeah, keep these on you at all times, in and out of the line, because you never know what's going to go on. I can't see you, Private Harvey. So I'm having problems again. You might need to move in a bit. Uh, not sure what's going on there, but uh, it's all right. Did we have to carry bandages? We well, yeah, we all carry bandages. These in our pockets of our battle dress, which are first field dressings. You can carry one of these, and this would have some shell dressing in there, so you'd rip this open and be able to apply it to yourself or your mate, and that would hopefully stop the bleeding before you could get them back to a first aid post or a surgeon's post. Uh, we also had in the line of a stretcher bearers, so they wear these armbands, and they'd be running around with great stretchers all over the place, trying to pick up the wounded men. What else have we got then? Oh, blimey, a few good questions there. Did the, apart from Christmas 14, did the sides talk much? Do you remember Christmas? You weren't there at Christmas, were you? I wasn't here. Oh, I was still well. training by then. Christmas 14, that was, yeah. That was a very interesting experience. We were sort of sitting in our, in our trenches on the line, and we could hear the Germans singing from across the barren no man's land. They were singing, Stieler Nacht their version of uh, Silent Night. <laughs> so we started trying to sing back in some broken broken German, but we didn't know German. So, uh, well, yeah, I remember the Germans then, they came out to no man's land, and a few of our boys went over there as well, and we agreed there was gonna be a bit of a truce. <laughs> a bit of a truce that would last on Christmas Day. 
I mean, this wasn't everywhere. I was speaking to a few lads afterwards, and they didn't know anything about it. So this didn't happen everywhere. <laughs> it's just a few sections of the line uh, that we sometimes swapped a bit of chocolate, a bit of that. Gave a German a, a shave if you know how to, if you know how to do that. But I mean, we don't really speak to the Germans like that. They are the enemy. We don't trade with them necessarily. You got to see them as the enemy in order to get the job done. They put up this one sign, this one time, this is a funny story, you'll like this one. <laughs> they put up this sign above their parapet, which said in German, God mit uns, God mit uns, so, which is German for God is with us, so one of our boys translated. So we put up this sign back, Got mit uns too. So I don't know if they understood our humour, but a uh, bit of a laugh. Did you sign up for where you conscripted? Do. <laughs> you signed up, didn't you? I did. So, back in um, September 1914, Kitchener's Second Army, he wanted 100,000 recruits, I was told. Uh, new recruits, because our boys were very limited over here. So, back in September 1914, I decided it would be a good job to join up. However, I was only 15 at the time, so I had to lie about my age. And when I went up to the officer, who was recruiting us, I, I told him I was only 18, but even that wasn't good enough, so he said, come back in half an hour when you're 19. So I did, I followed his instructions, and I came back and I told him I was 19. So there I was, I was transformed slowly into a soldier at only the age of uh, 15, back in 1914. And Ethan, as he said earlier, he was obviously in the army back in 1912. Yeah, I didn't just finished uh, another shift at my workplace, Lawrence and Scott's in the city, and I thought, right, I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> so I went down to the, the local recruiting office for the Norfolk Regiment, and I uh, signed on, did uh, six months of training, and we were sent off to Northern Ireland in 1912. And it wasn't easy, it wasn't too bad, it wasn't too bad. So we're both volunteers, yeah, we volunteered for this. I do hear that they're starting to conscript people now. <laughs> Sounds like a shell coming over there. But yeah, they are starting to conscript some of the lads in. Uh, we realised that obviously we needed as many men as we could get to get the job done out here. <laughs> so uh, they're coming in as much as much as they can, can get them really. But there are a lot of a lot of them coming in quite young now. So we are seeing 17 and 18 year olds. I'm 25 myself. I'm now 17. Yeah, Raven's getting, getting on a bit. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're seeing younger lads come out with the conscripts. And you can always tell a conscript from us us regular soldiers. And they always seem to wear their kit a bit more shoddily. Not as smart as us regulars. What else have we got? Yeah. How do you find being in the army at such a young age? <laughs> well, I think the reason I joined up, I... I, well, I I joined up with a couple of um, friends of mine and we thought it'd be a good idea. Um, you know, we wanted to impress the ladies back at home, I suppose. Um, then also my brother here, he um, volunteered back in 1912, so I sort of want to follow in his footsteps and, you know, look impressive, I suppose. But it's okay, it's not as bad as I probably would have thought it would have been. Um, but yes, it's not bad. Not that bad. I remind you that next time you're swearing, carrying wire up to the line. <laughs> but yeah, the army's done wonders, really. It took all these sort of underage, underweight, baby-faced men, and it drilled them into proper soldiers. It drilled them into proper men. Oh, my feet are hurting a bit. On average, our new recruits put on about a pound, uh, pound of stone in weight and an inch in height. And yeah, so we made them into proper, proper soldiers. So our rifles, yeah, throw me up my rifle from down the line. Oh, I'll steal yours. <laughs> the famous smelly rifle, of course. The short magazine Lee Enfield. This is a very, very good rifle. And it's nicknamed the smelly rifle, because if you take the initials, short magazine Lee Enfield, and say it quickly, you got the SMLE. And you say that quickly? Smelly. You got the smelly. So it takes 10 of our rounds, which we keep in our in our webbing pouches. We've got 150 rounds on us in our pouches. And 
the magazine. Oh, yeah, we've got, we've got a few more in my bandolier because we might be expected to go over the top in a bit. But that takes 10 rounds nice and snug in your magazine. And you can get some pretty rapid fire on that. So it's known as the Mad Minute. And you could do about 30 rounds in a minute from some rapid firing. So these are very, very effective rifles. We do love these rifles. Highly accurate, nice and short, not too bad at all. I remember when we were first using them against the Germans at Mons, one of the first battles in the war, our Royal Fusilier boys were firing these so quickly that the Germans thought they were fighting a battalion of machine gunners. Very stand steady rifles. You like them? Yeah. Better than what we used to shoot down the fair, shooting rabbits with hunting rifles. What we got? Did you participate in the Battle of the Somme? Oh, we've got a French chap asking us some questions. He was... Uh, oh, my French is rubbish, but he uh, he was at the Somme. Wow. Brave man. French did very well at the Somme and Verdun. Some great battles from the French there. Um, were you at the Somme? I was. I, yeah, Somme. I landed here in, in Boulogne in 1915, July 1915, after my training. Uh, I was here in the Somme for the first day. Uh, our main objective being in the um, 8th Battalion, Norfolk Regiment, uh, was to capture or to reach the uh, German, uh, so the M enemy lines at Montebon. And my friends got back to too. <laughs> but that was our objective, and we did end up capturing that. We did, we did alright on the first day of the Somme. Yeah, truth be told, alright, we were six, six, seven hours behind schedule. We went over the top at two minutes past six in the morning, and we were supposed to get to our objective by about eight o'clock. But we didn't get there till four. But we didn't expect it. We bombarded the Germans for, for days before. So we weren't expecting it. And we were we told the barbed wire had been cut. And yeah, the, the Germans had all it? been wiped out by the bombardment. So yeah, we sort of walked straight into that one. I lost lost many good friends on, on that day. How long does it take to make a trench? Well, most of the trenches we've been sat in now, they've been here for a few years. We haven't moved too much. If we're lucky enough to capture a German trench, they're a lot better made. They expected to be sat in theirs for a while. <laughs> but, uh, oh well, Do you, have you dug any trenches in your time? Well, when we were in training back in England, we had to practice trench digging. Yeah, um, yeah. That probably took about a day, just under a day. Yeah, a day of a good sort of company of men, you could make yeah. a decent trench system. I remember one trench system we were training in was on Mouse Old Heath. <laughs> We weren't too far from where I lived actually, so it was nice to sort of still still be close to home. I uh, weren't allowed to go home obviously. But uh, we had some good old training trenches out there, and some nice rifle ranges as well. We used to watch the cavalry from Nelson Barracks go up and down and uh, hunt wild boar that used to roam around the heath. So that was uh, the good old days before, before 500,000 heavily armed Germans came into view. Oh, have we come across a tank? Oh, tank. September, yeah, water tank, yeah, uh, as we call them. A tank. Have you seen any tanks? I think I might have been lucky enough to see one in my time. Yeah. They're, they're very brand new. I think they've only been out a few weeks. They have. Well, we used them on the Somme, I'm told. I don't know too much about them. But uh, I remember one speaking to one chap who was in B Company, and he was, was with his mates behind the line, and he said, Quick, come and, have a, come and have a look at this. This is going to end the war. We'll be owned by Christmas. We'll be owned by Christmas because we've got this new invention. So we went round back behind this field, and there was these rows of big metal metal machines covered in covered in tarpaul and stuff. So we asked the officer, "What are those?" And he said, "They're tanks." Well, we thought they were just water tanks. We thought they held water because you always need water in a trench. But now they're these great big noisy metal machines that were rolling across no man's land and rolling over the barbed wire. So yeah, tank's a good invention. I do like a tank. Speckled Jim. We've got Speckled Jim. Do you want to bring old Percy, Percy up here? Being in a trench in the front line, you need to get messages, <laughs> messages to other positions. You could send a runner. You might get shot though. You could send a messenger dog. Did that quite a few times, but we've got a little pigeon here. Oh, Specky Jim in his little cage. So we might have to send him off with a message 
uh, at some point. These are homing pigeons. He could get through to our, our positions a lot quicker than a runner. If he wasn't shot down, the Germans, they'd have good fun shooting at them as they were flying off from the trenches. But they're very reliable birds. Very reliable birds. Have you managed to get anything from the Germans? Well, we actually have. Uh, I remember us went on a trench raid, we actually managed to get some Germans ourselves. Uh, trench raids, trench raids are fairly dangerous. You take all your kit off and you go out for a sap and you're sliding along no man's land. And you might only have a pistol and one of these, which is our trench club. Uh, Raven, he made that one himself, didn't you? I did. I used um, an old cricket bat here um, and I managed to wrap around a load of barbed wire so I could go and hit a few Germans um, wherever I want to fight like so. Very deadly weapons. Yeah. Um, you get in quick, you jump in the trench, you garrot or you bayonet the first bloke that comes towards you, and then you throw a couple of hand grenades in their dugout, and that would sort them out. Thank you very much. We've got a few interesting uh, bits for our collections here. I managed to pick this one up. This is a uh, German officer's cap. Uh, I took that one myself off a prisoner. Uh, he was quite happy to surrender, actually. So I think he was glad that the war the war was over for him. I'll put that down there. And I even managed to bag, you're jealous, an iron cross off uh, the same German officer. That'll make a few bob in years to come. I, don't, I can't see there being much cause for collecting these. I'll probably melt that one down and make it into a nice ornament or something. Nice brooch for the ladies, though. German... Oh, I know. For Africa. Oh, apparently we're losing in Africa. A place called Gallipoli. Germans uh, want to tell it's particularly uh, minting our boys up. Well, I don't believe that. It's propaganda. It's probably propaganda. Because we're, we're t we believe we're winning the war. We're winning yeah. the war everywhere. And we're going to be home soon. <laughs> well, it's... Oh. What? Yeah, we'll have a little look down the line and see what we've got for the trench. Lead the way, Private Harvey. Oh, let's have a look down here then. Yeah, we're going to take you on a small little tour of our lovely little trench here. So, you see here we've got all supplies that we might need. Uh, we're out in the front line, we've got our Mills bombs over there. Here, yeah, handy bombs these, you get in, you throw a couple of them at the Germans. Yep. Everything here for the cooking that I think we showed you earlier. The lovely uh, stew with the heart axe there and the corned beef. And we've got um, a piece there because we're not allowed to produce any smoke from our fire. So this will hopefully stop the smoke rising up. Because if you show smoke over the top, uh, a few German shells will probably land on you. Got a bit of food, nice bit of table there. Keep your head in. down, this is the firing step. Yeah, we stay low down here. You can see we've got all our protection from the corrugated iron, uh, the wooden beams as well, and on top of the sandbags uh, for even more protection from any, any shells or ammunition um, bullets. All right, cutters, before an attack, a few of us might go over the line to cut a few of the barbed wire to clear a path for our attack and a trench ladder there for when we do go over into no man's land. I mean, we burnt the last one, so they're not that good. We've got a little bit of a bit down here. Officers dug out in here. Everything that he might need. Um, even a small hole for scouting. Or well, anyway. perhaps a sniper position, something a bit like that. Yeah. That's nice in there. Got a few Australians sending their best wishes as well. Well, we oh, wish yeah. the Australians good luck. The Australians are great troops. I uh, did manage to meet an Australian while I was behind the line. Uh, I won't tell you where, because, uh, yeah. <laughs> but a friendly bunch of chaps, the Aussies. They're good Anzac troops, and they're good at digging trenches. And particularly good at digging tunnels. So did we get letters from home? Are we writing some letters? Have you written any recently? Yes, I managed to write a letter to my dear mother back home in Norwich, um, still waiting on a reply uh, from her. Still family. waiting on a reply from still. mum? That's just, I takes, takes a biscuit doesn't it really? It does. <laughs> I've got a nice photograph from home there, my 
my darling wife that's waiting for me. So, uh, can't wait to get back really. But uh, yeah, writing home is, is very important to keep up our spirits in receiving letters. I mean, you might not receive a letter, every, everything's got to be brought up really by hand. So, if the, uh, the company postmaster gets unfortunately squashed by a German shell, then you might not get any post this week. Which is rather annoying. We have to be careful of the uh, censorship. We have to be careful what we say. Yeah. In the letters. We can't give away any information or um, positions or times or dates. Yeah, it's this uh, one officer in our battalion. He took uh, great care to read everybody's letters before they got sent home. <laughs> and he would cross out all of the, the bits that we weren't supposed to say. So, uh, yeah. Do we get much news from home? Well, we do, yes and no. Um, in our letters from our family, they like to let us know what's going on uh, around around the, <coughs> around the community. So that's good. But you've just come back from home, haven't you? I have. I've just been on a small bit of leave back home in Norwich. Um, so bring, also bringing all the news back home, uh, back here with me to tell my brother and all the other men. Anything interesting going on at home? Or any same as oh, usual. I can think of. I think that that old Joan has now um, left her left her husband. Left her husband. Left her husband. No, I mean. Not right at the time, is it? <laughs> well, that's how, how how it goes, I suppose. Must be looked going back to the French village. Oh well, yeah. There's some some lovely French French villages just off our section of the line, and uh, one of them's got this great theatre, <laughs> and they put on shows for the chaps. Uh, I remember at one point last year, I think it was, I managed to, to get up to Wipers myself, which is what uh, we call Yeep. And they've got some great, great performances in there, in their playhouses. There's not many buildings left now, but if you're lucky enough to get to a small village, uh, every good sized village has, uh, <clears throat> how would you say it, friendly, friendly people. Um, so yeah, it's not all, it's not all too bad. Oh, a few more, any more? Anything else you want to add? Look what we're wearing. Yeah, I mean the uniforms. Might be are... wondering what we are wearing. What are we wearing? I wonder what we're wearing half the time. Well, let's start from the bottom here. We've got our B5 boots. Okay, so there we go. Studded, hobnailed boots there. Go on, they're good. very comfortable. Well, are they comfortable? Do you think they're comfortable? I love them. They're they're, yeah. they're good boots. They're very good boots. I'll probably good, be keeping a pair. Marching, keeping a pair way. when I get back home. Keep a pair got, of them. We've got our puttees on. As we talked about uh, to support the lower leg there. Um, and the and our service dress service uniform. Dress. Yes. When when were you issued that then? Oh, the day I signed up. The day you signed up. Pretty much. I mean, this stuff came in. Uh, I think it was 1908. Uh, was it 1908 or 1902? Yeah. Well, before my time. <laughs> but a uh, lovely wool uniform. Uh, not too bad. I remember getting my boots though. Uh, particularly, I got two pairs of boots. My first pair of boots got ruined. Um, but I got a second pair of boots, so I was very lucky. But this was in 1914. Boots were in very, very short supply. And I went to the, to the sergeant. I said, Sergeant, my, my boots, they don't fit me. And he said, there's no such thing as army boots that don't fit. It's your feet. They're too big for the boots. So I had to make do and uh, carry on with them. But it's a nice uniform. Don't look very smart, particularly. <laughs> but it gets the job done. And as the war's gone on, we've got new hats, new things like that. We've got the helmets. I remember getting issued a helmet. And we thought they made very good frying pans if you couldn't get to your mess tins could heat it up over there on the top and fry an egg perhaps. But we also have the, the infamous trench caps, which are just like the old service dress caps, but these ones are nice and soft, they fold up and go in your pocket. Um, yeah, so well, this, issue, this uniform was actually issued to me back in 1915, although I, when I was training we we weren't given a uniform, we were only given a belt and a rifle and a, and a cap. And um, then after that we got given the Kitchener Blues uniforms, which are a bit similar to this, but they were more basic and blue. 
Yeah. But then eventually I was issued with these and I was quite happy with the pair I got. They w they did fit to begin with, but now I'm starting to grow out. But well, make sure remind me and I'll make sure you get a new tunic when we get back to that, that village. There's some very nice, very nice friendly ladies there that do our do our stitching, our repairs if we pay them well. Um, a lot of them actually like the jam. There's a lot of shortages in the French villages. And we, we keep getting lots and lots of jam sent over, so we're, we're saving the jam till we can we can swap that with uh, the French villagers. We'll swap that for some cigarettes, uh, perhaps for some field repairs. <laughs> or if they clean our uniform, they can clean our, our underwear for us and we'll, we'll pay them in jam. That's always good stuff. The only problem with the uniform is they seem to infect, they seem to get infected by lice <laughs> quite a bit. So the best way... Just saying the word lice makes me itch yeah, all over. Yeah, more lice there. Small little little things and they get all over the place. The only best way I find to deal with lice is I'll show you on my hat. So, on the trench cap. The lice, they get in all the seams of your clothing and they lay their eggs and then they move on. And they, they suck your blood. So it's not particularly pleasant. It's like that way. Cheers. But the best way to deal... With lices, you get a match or a candle. You get a match or a candle, and uh, you sit there with it on your seams, and you burn all of the lice eggs out. And this is called chatting. It's something we get, we do quite a bit, because burning the eggs, they go pop, 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 or chat, 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 as you burn the eggs, and they make a nice little popping sound. So that's something to pass the time. I heard some people even eat them. You might eat them, yeah. <laughs> I was told you could eat them. Oh yeah, I think that was from that Scottish bloke we met a few months ago. He used to sit there with his clothing and he used to bite the eggs out between, squashing between his teeth. Don't do a lot of good though. I mean, as soon as you've burnt the eggs out, killed the lice, as soon as you put it back on your body, your body heat will hatch all of the ones that you missed and you're back to square one. But it passes the time. Do we play card games? Well, I think we just do anything really to pass the time. Uh, the only thing worse than the German shells is some other poetry. You got a poem for us? Nothing. Oh, I have a quick think. Poetry is not too bad. We wrote write some poems. There's a few mag trench magazines that go around, and they offer tips for staying occupied. I mean, outside of the lines, when we're not in the front line. There is an awful lot of gambling going on. Talking to the Australians and the Canadians. Well, they gamble more money than I've ever seen in my life. They're terrific at gambling, the Australians. Um, so yeah. And we play fun games as well. Anything that sort of amuses us. You laugh at the slightest thing. Yeah. And of course, otherwise, also pass the time. I read the Bible. Yeah. There, um, so I can keep keep the time going by having a little read through parts of the Bible to keep my morale up during these the horrors of the shells, really. Yeah, um, well, talking of shells, we seem to get shelled quite a bit these days, and um, particularly in a frontline trench. If, uh, if the Germans find out where our latrines are, our toilets, which we've dug sort of just over there behind uh, <coughs> behind that fence. We've got a, a small little latrine trench, but if the Germans can get that sighted, well, they know we like to go to the toilets first thing in the morning, so they, they drop a few shells on there. <laughs> but yeah, if you produce any light or smoke, there'll be a few shells coming over. Here's my shell. Yeah. Oh, blimey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I've got a... Uh, the top bit of a shell there that didn't exactly blow up, <laughs> but yes. It will make a nice flower pot. It will make a nice flower pot, or we could use that as a cup. What do you think? We put a candle in that, a bit of wax, pin it up somewhere. <laughs> but the normal way that these high explosive shells go off, this will be flying through the air. It'll blow up and all the fragments of metal will spread out all over the place. And normally it'll explode a few feet up in the above us, sending all bits of metal and fragments flying down, which is really the main reason for our helmets. This isn't going to stop a sniper's bullet, anything coming straight at us, but it is going to stop 
shells raining down on top of us. So, if something blows up above us, yeah, they deflect off rather than uh, going straight through your head, which is always a positive. Do you all have a Bible? Oh, well, Bibles, you know, they're superstitious things. Uh, soldiers seem to be a superstitious bunch of people, so not necessarily for religious reasons, but perhaps just for superstitious reasons. I mean, I like to think that a lot of us are more religious yeah. than perhaps people might be in the future. But I mean, once you come out here in a trench like this, you have to have to question what religion uh, does for you, really. But no, you get uh, the odd stories you hear. You hear behind the lines. You hear one or two people boasting how a Bible once stopped a bullet. But you never know. It doesn't happen to anyone you know. It just happens to to people that uh, your friend has once passed whilst on the way to a, a mess tent, perhaps. Oh, the sun's a bit bright today, isn't it? Uh, what is there? Tunes, music, yeah, we like to have a sing-song, keep ourselves entertained with a bit of a song. Well, yeah, give us one. a song. Go I think on, you want to give us a song. Alright. Uh, we, we have, like, popular songs, and we make up our own lyrics sometimes. So, uh... Ooh. Do you want to find the sergeant? Yeah. Do you want to find the sergeant? I know where he is. I know where he is. I know where he is. You want to find the sergeant? I know where he is. He's probably lying on the canteen floor drunk. Particularly our sergeant in the, yeah. in the Norfolk's. But he'll probably shoot me for saying that one. <laughs> but nah, anything to keep you entertained. A popular sing-song. If you're lucky enough to get a gramophone, or if one of the lads can play, can play the piano, you can find one of them. And we can bring it up here and have a sing-song. Yeah, I think Ethan here, he's played an accordion once, I think he practiced it. Yeah, I found this French French accordion lying on the side of the road, so I took it back with us to the reserve trench. I think he played all the right notes, but in the wrong order. <laughs> like that one, yes. Do we have any kind of something relief? Oh, I'm going to have to go a bit closer there. Do oh, do we, yeah, I do need your glasses. Do we have any kind of pain relief? Rum. <laughs> Rum's particularly useful. Before going over the top, you'll uh, lucky enough sometimes get passed around a hip flask of scotch or something nice to give you a bit of courage. But rum ration is, is greatly important on the old SDR jars that come around. Everybody gets two, two tablespoons of rum and that's your ration. Although, a lot of the time, our sergeant again, he'll be uh, coming between the trench with the rum and he'll, uh, he'll say to you, I'll have my two spoonfuls of you. So he has his two spoonfuls with uh, number one section, then he has his two spoonfuls of number two section, and he has his two spoonfuls of number three section. So by the time we get down to Ross here at the end of the line, there's barely any rum left. Well, yeah, we've both got the same last name. We are related, Harvey. But we do have our service numbers, which will be different. So on our ID discs here, don't know where you can see those, but this has got our last name, our initial, and our service numbers. So my service number is 021199. And Raven's 260303. So, yeah, that's how you tell us a it's got different service numbers. But like you said earlier, Ethan uh, obviously volunteered and joined up in 1912 before this war took place and then I followed in his footsteps in September 1914 and um, Kitchener asked for new recruits. Mm. That's why we're both here. We must be together in the same trench. Yeah, well, you'll get mixed about eventually and put in a good word for, about him with, uh, with one of the officers so we managed to get him out here with us. <laughs> but most of us feel sort of know each other from back home, we're all mainly from the same sort of areas of Norfolk. So lucky enough to get out here. Got a few strangers in it mind, because uh, when you join <coughs> when you join a regiment you get moved about. So if we join up in Norfolk, you'll come together to the Norfolk regiment, you'll get quickly moved off up into Yorkshire perhaps, or down into Kent, or even Essex, Colchester, yeah. So regiments will get moved around. 
So yeah, if you want to join a bit late, you might be from Essex, but you can end up joining the Norfolk Regiment if you bump into them. But I mean, the war has changed, <laughs> changed quite a lot from back in when it started in '14 to now. I think I mean I hardly recognise it. It started with big open warfare, and the Germans they'd be coming towards us on horseback, it's cavalry, and you'd be there with your bayonet and your rifle, um, and that would be really all you had. You wouldn't have any gas equipment or helmets or <coughs> any shovels, anything like that. Uh, big open battles. But now we're all just dug in down here, in uh, tr the trenches. It's stalemate, wasn't it? Yeah, stalemate, that's a good word, that. Yeah, and then you came along, <laughs> you don't know any different, do you? No. Nope, I can't nope. remember what it was like at Mons. Oh, let's have a look. All I remember was the first gas attack, and I think that's about it. When it gets cold. I have to do with it getting cold right now. <laughs> what do we wear when it gets cold? We wear our great coats, our overcoats. We've got one with us at the moment. Um, but don't we, need it, do we? We we'll each have one of those and we we'll use those to get warm when we're sleeping out here in the front line trench. Yeah, uh, but these these tunics as well, they keep us warm. But they keep us warm in the in the winter. Yeah, and, and underneath. Cool in the summer. Underneath, he's got a, a woolen shirt as well, so that helps. <laughs> but I remember back in 1915, sort of the first uh, the first winter we had here. Winter 14, 15. Uh, we were buying up loads of sheepskin and goat skins and getting our tailors to just cut a hole in the top and you'd stick your head through it, you'd cover yourself in the skin, uh, the fur, wrap a, <coughs> wrap, a, wrap a belt round it, do it up, and you'd made a sort of uh, fur jacket. So they were very warm, they stunk quite a bit, particularly when they got wet, they didn't smell too good. But they were they were very very warm. Uh, we also have these new for newer things, these leather jerkins, which are nice leather, again insulating the body, keeping you warm. And they're very good for when going on trench raids because you can slide across the mud of no man's land in a leather jerkin. Uh, from home, we'd also get sent knitted knitted stuff. So I don't know, have you got any knitted gloves, Mum? Send you anything? I haven't. No. Well, you get knitted gloves balaclavas, that sort of thing. We've got a, a woolen cap that we might also wear if it gets a bit colder. It tends to get colder at night. Uh, luckily I haven't seen action in the snow. They sent me a nice hanky. Sent you a nice hanky, well, that'll come in With handy. With my initials. It? Oh, very nice, very nice. <laughs> what else have we got? Oh, do you know the, do you know Mademoiselle from Armitage? That's a good song. We're going to have a quick sing song. You can have a sing. You well, lead you it. Go, go on. No. <laughs> but yeah, there's some, some good songs, but like I said, a lot of the lads, we'd uh, change the words around. We probably Keep us in good spirits. Yeah, we probably won't sing you our versions. <laughs> but no, it's not, not too bad. Not too bad. I remember one, one of our officers, he described it as a sort of a Boy Scouts <coughs> camping trip. Camping trip with the lads with yeah, just feel like a, a hint of danger. I mean, well, particularly when it's quiet, when the Germans aren't shelling us. You're here with your friends, and you know it's it's not too bad. You have a bit of a laugh. You've got to stay cheerful. You don't want to do too much thinking. You just get amused by the funniest things, and you do your four days in the front line, and then you go back to the reserve line, and you do sort of five or six days there, and then you go back to a rest centre. Well, they, they say a rest centre. You'll be you're used quite a lot for carrying things, fetch and carry, carry this ammunition up to the reserve line through the communication trenches, which are, are lines between the two, between the front and the reserve. So you're carrying stuff constantly. But yes, yeah, work of a soldier. What else? Yeah, got it. Yes, you also might be wondering what I. I'm wearing, um, this is my wearing set that we were all issued with. Well, they, I mean, when I was doing my training in 1914, 1915, I was issued with leather equipment. Did you ever have the leather P14? Oh, I saw leather? some chaps with the leather equipment, you know, the P14 stuff as they called it. <laughs> it weren't too bad, it was based on what the army were using really before this lovely weather and stuff. Yeah, Victorian that, stuff. that's what I had first for training and then eventually we were issued uh, with the 1908 webbing set so I've got my belt and the, the straps here keeping it all together and then 
I've got my five pockets there for the ammunition. And see, each pocket holds two um, clips, uh, rounds. Uh, so that's 100, isn't it, Ethan? Yes, that's as 100 <laughs> rounds I would carry on my webbing. And then a bit further round, I have the bayonet to go on the end of the. Day. The Enfield. Yeah, our lovely 1907 bayonets there on our rifles. And these are good old long things. These are, were great at the start of the war when we were fighting in fields against cavalry. And you could reach up and hit the cavalrymen. I mean, they're quite good in, in longer trenches. I mean, yes. they're a bugger to manoeuvre with. But in the trench raids, if, you, bad. if you're going from over jumping in, then you can, yeah, you can easily. Get What's the word? Oh, you can thrust Go out. In and you do a lot of training. I kill remember a couple of Germans. Yeah, I remember the old bayonet training. You'd uh, you'd scream your head off and <laughs> charge into a sack, and that would imitate the enemy. But nice ones. If you could get your hands on a spare one, you'd be able to file it down. If you knew a blacksmith, you can make it into a fighting knife and something a bit a bit easier to use. <clears throat> We'd also have our entrenching tool. So there's a handle. I can grab the stick, or even can grab his, sorry, his, his uh, head. But you can grab it out. Just got to do this in a hurry. I know. <laughs> so, I mean, this is what we're making trench clubs out of as well. You could uh, s <coughs> use lead hobnails, and you could put them into the top bit, or nails, and you could use that as a weapon in a trench raid. He's done a bit of difficulty getting his head out there. But yeah, it would come in two parts, and you'd put it together, and you'd be able to use this bit as a shovel, and this bit as a pickaxe. Well, so that's what we were using when we yeah. dug out some of the trenches alongside the pioneer tools, like the bigger shovel and the bigger pickaxe as well. Yeah, I mean you'd have to do a lot of repairs yourself. So if a bit if a shell landed on one end of your trench, you'd have to to scoop that one up, scoop it up, do it, repair it as best you could. There are many ways of carrying these. I mean, my personal favourite is undoing my tunic buttons and carrying it there. But tell them where you used to carry yours. Well, I used to carry mine down here. Put it in the trousers. I learned off a... Who did I learn off? That Australian bloke, The Australian, the Australian man told me to do that. Well, well, he didn't tell me to, but I saw him doing it. I thought it would be a good idea because that's what I want to best protect. <laughs> <laughs> do we use the bayonet for anything other than the bayonet? Not necessarily. I mean, we don't uh, use it for cooking. We would carry, we would uh, have um, like cutlery, knives, and things. Um, one of our chaps he used his his razor to cut up bits of meat because it was sharper than his knife. But I mean, the bayonet came in handy for sawing up a loaf of bread. Or what we got? Yes. Spoon there. So on the cutlery. There, yeah. I got my spoon. You can see, I got my spoon. And I decided to cut the top off. And sharpen that there so I can use that as a knife as well. Multi purpose there. Five minute warning. I think we're going to on the top soon. Right. Wow, we've really been here that long. Well, we're going to be going over the top you. in a bit. Anything else? But, yes, right. quickly on the back of us, we're both carrying us. We've got our, yeah, the small packs, the haversacks below that. We've got to carry our mess tins. This is what we eat out of. And we clean in them, we cook in them, we do everything in our mess tins. They're very handy pieces of kit. So we do love a good mess tin. Yes. And if, well, like now, we're now going over the top. Yeah. So we'd also, yeah, uh, have you got me across that bag, that thing there? We'd also carry these. These are our iron ration bags. So in here we carry some more biscuits, some salt tablets, and... Uh, uh, corned beef and so maybe some emergency stew and this would tie turn around please by Ruben this would tie on your small pack so you carry that with you when going over the top so that in that bag is sort of enough food to survive for 24 or 48 also, hours also the water bottles there with they would carry uh, two pints of water so it's important to keep hydrated in these yep. times so I think we're, we're going to stand to and get pulled over in a minute. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. So I think now it is so very almost 3 p.m. our time, uh, which means we have a scheduled 
over the top trench raid, don't you? So yes, as much of the time in the trenches I said you'd be sitting around uh, on duty, you aren't allowed to take your kit off in a trench, uh, in a frontline trench that is, but we are now off over the top, which was the <laughs> something we all feared I think. Thank you very much. So you'd be standing to, you'd have to stand to every morning and every dawn for about uh, dusk for an hour, but going over the top we would fix bayonets. So, without dropping things everywhere, so bayonets would be fixed. One of our officers, he, uh, he came down the line this one time asking us um, asking us if we had any personal letters that we wanted to, to leave with him to send. But I think that's it, we're going to get called too. Yep. So, company stand. <clears throat> We hope you've enjoyed your little foray here into 1916. Uh, thank you very much.